So, good morning everyone. Um, thank you for coming, um, at least those who stay. Um, my name is Peter Gollert, I'm an editor on the English Wikipedia and I'll be talking today about uh, indigenous knowledge um, and in which way we want to, in which way we already do actually ban existing rules on the English Wikipedia. I am referring to the English Wikipedia, let me say that first because it's got the most extensive set of rules and because we believe that um, if we can make something work on the English Wikipedia that is to be accepted by the editor community, then we believe that, uh, okay, the only bigger hurdle is probably German, but uh, all the other Wikipedias would, would have no problem with that if, if even the English Wikipedia is doing that. Also, if you catch me sometimes saying we, doesn't mean that I want to use the plural as my status here. It is simply uh, that this is not a project of me alone. I'm the only one presenting here. I've been creating the slides, uh, but it is a larger research and activism group. So this is what, what I want to do approximately. I want to go through, uh, at first I need to go through some of the terminology because the topic is a little bit misleading and it's not very well known what indigenous knowledge is. And I also, I do not really know whether you're coming here because you know what indigenous knowledge is and you want to see how to implement it or whether you're, uh, whether, whether your uh, familiarity with the terminology is, is a little bit less. So there are many misconceptions that I, I will go through the terminology. I will also say something about the value of indigenous knowledge because uh, I'm absolutely sure it has been undervalued, consistently undervalued since Wikipedia was founded. Then I will outline what needs to happen currently under the current interpretation of the rules of the English Wikipedia, what needs to happen for a piece of indigenous knowledge to make it into an article, and I'll show you that this is a very, very long and winding path, walking which will lose a lot of the content and will bend a lot of the facts. And then I'll suggest, because you know, only moaning doesn't help, uh, then I'll suggest what instead we could be doing. I should also say that this is what this wasn't my idea first. Uh, to, to see the gap and to do something about it. Mr. Prabala is uh, in the audience. He, he actually started that, uh, but I'll provide a slightly different way. And then, uh, okay, I originally planned, if I had a minute left, that I will talk a little bit about the Knowledge Portal project, the Namibia Knowledge Portal. I'll not be doing that because I've been granted a three minute time slot in the afternoon in the Activating Africa session. So I'll not do that. If we have more time, then we can have more questions and answers. So this is the roadmap for the next 20 minutes. We start with the introduction, of course. What is indigenous knowledge? Let us first look at what indigenous is. And I'd like you to, I'd like you to pay attention to the lack of the word ethnicity and the lack of the word tribe and people in general, right? It is originating in or characteristic of a particular region or country. It has nothing to do with with with, with Maori somewhere or Indians or Kavangos or Bushmen. It is indigenous simply is it's restricted to a region. That's all it means. Now what is knowledge? There, there have been, you know, what knowledge is, is the core of epistemology and it has been debated for the past 2,500 years, but uh, this is a reasonable definition. I'm not kind of picking one that suits me. Uh, knowledge today would still be, uh, pretty much any definition of knowledge would be traced back to Plato, who said that it's a justified true belief. If you want to say that I know something, it must first be true, because I can't know wrong things, right? The things that are not the case. Secondly, I must believe it. And thirdly, I must have a justification. And then we can talk about a reasonable justification, a good justification, scientific justification. But uh, in its original form, it, was, it needs to be justified, otherwise it's not knowledge. So what does it mean together? 
And here I'm, I'm, I'm borrowing from an expert in the subject, uh, indigenous knowledge is the body of emic knowledge, and emic is historically constituted, instrumental in the long-term adaptation of a group of humans to their environment. And that is something which is far removed from what most people think that indigenous knowledge is. And for that particular reason, I take you through the terminology. I'll go a little bit into, sorry, I'll go a little bit into more detail later on. There are a few aspects, a few pros, uh, properties of indigenous knowledge where the Wikipedia, Wikipedia community says that, ooh, uh, that's not good for our online encyclopedia, right? It's normally not codified in writing, but in songs, in dances, in artifacts, uh, stories, items, objects. But it's mostly oral. It's furthermore very often practical instead of abstract, and it is rooted in a way to explain the world from a spiritual perspective more than from a scientific in terms of Western scientific, first world scientific framework. But wait a moment. We said, what is knowledge? We said, justified, true, belief, right? Particularly, it does not say that the justification itself needs to be true because that leads us into paradoxes. So we cannot even demand that from our scientific knowledge. If we say that our justification is true, then we get into paradoxes. But I have even a better explanation because I know, you know it's still not good if, 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 if I grant everything on, on, on spiritual backgrounds. Um, at first, its assertions are true. <laughs> People are doing that, and I'll give you example in a moment, examples in a moment. Secondly, the belief is, of course, out of the question. Of course, they believe that, 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 that what, they are, what they are practicing. And thirdly, it is very, very nicely justified just by that it works, if nothing else. We're talking about technology. We are not, I'll come to that in a moment as well. So it's working. And that is a perfect justification, even if I take the Western definition of knowledge. And Plato, of course, uh, is the, a representative of what we, uh, of, of, of the developed world, not only that time, but even now. Indigenous knowledge, and that's very important, indigenous knowledge is not a traditional knowledge. It's not about who was our tribal chief 213 years ago. It is not about when did our tribe cross the Orange River to settle in Namibia. It's not about that. That is traditional knowledge. It has nothing to do with indigenous knowledge. You will find indigenous knowledge in ecology, in agriculture, medicine, uh, I made you that list, I don't need to read it out. And indigenous knowledge is, I say it again, very often about technology. Technology that you might call primitive, that I might call primitive. I have a European background by myself, but primitive, I would say, not in a, not in a negative connotation, but in its positive connotation, saying it doesn't use many resources, it's not very difficult to do. And, very important, oral that knowledge transfer works, right? If only you think about writing, writing is approximately 2,000 years old. So there are pockets of the world where there has been a proto-writing 5,000 years ago. But since when do we have to acknowledge that humans are capable of knowing that is at least 50,000 years old? It's probably a few hundred thousand years old, but 50,000 years ago was uh, what we call the Great Leap Forward where a, a, a huge development uh, took place. And from that time on, there's no question anymore by no scientist in the world that humans have been knowing. And knowledge needs to be transferred in form of information, remember that. Because uh, if I have knowledge, and if I want you to gain knowledge, then I need to put you into a position where the information that I, can try, uh, that I can convey to you is going to build up a justification in your mind. 
right? So knowledge transfer, if it, if it was easier, then we could kind of skip the entire education system, then we just speak everything on, on a cassette and, and, and let our kids hear it all day. That's not working, you know. It's, had knowledge not been codified in oral form, we would not be sitting here. There wouldn't be airplanes, there wouldn't be electricity, there would probably not be fancy buildings or microphones where you have to sit instead of stand, right? So it has been working for thousands of millennia. It's not that it's dysfunctional. Okay, what does Wikipedia misses, miss out on if there is a resistance, and I'll show you what the resistance is in a minute, if there's a resistance <coughs> on uh, indigenous knowledge. You you might stumble already over the first uh, example. I put it in on purpose, the Antiquitera mechanism uh, from ancient Greece, uh, first century BC analog computer. You would say, well, is that indigenous? Yes, of course. Five, six hundred years ago, no global communication, right? No book printing, not much knowledge sharing. Pretty much every knowledge was indigenous at that time. Remember, indigenous? Nothing to do with Indians and, 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 and tribesmen, but restricted to a region. So that's exciting knowledge, what you're saying. Or if you look at uh, number, number three, you might think it's a bead down here or a necklace. Scientists, scientists would today agree that it's very likely a very difficult and sophisticated system of bookkeeping. And look at the different knots, the different size of the knots. Look at the cross connections between the different strings. Uh, nobody has deciphered it yet. Right? Terra Preta, my famous example, or my, my most favorite example. Please read it up on Wikipedia. But please also read that the editor who last edited it put a sentence in that the intentionality of that technique has never been proven. And that is quite ridiculous. I, I, I speak about that example in the paper, and I'll tell you at the end of the, uh, of the presentation where you get that paper. Uh, it's too difficult now to explain, otherwise I'll be running over time. Now, with the first four examples, I think it's five, yes, it's five. With the first four examples, I've been cheating a little bit because those facts are indeed on Wikipedia. But you have to search hard to find really indigenous knowledge. The last example, that's a genuine example. None of these things exist on Wikipedia because for none of these things I can produce what the editor community would say is a reliable, verifiable, independent, third-party source. Right? But there are communities in Namibia where I'm coming from that build a house with a fridge, an aircon, and a stove, and what else? And lighting, without using any conventional source of electricity, uh, of energy, electricity, burning fire, nothing like that, right? And it's working, and it's all of those technologies are in the price range of a two-digit US dollar number. So they built you a fridge, which will last your entire life, which is working every day of the year, and they're not spending 100 US dollars on it. And it's actually a walk-in fridge, so it's two by three meters. So I believe it's exciting knowledge. Why should Wikipedia not have that? So now I'll show you what needs to happen currently if a piece of indigenous knowledge wants to make it into a Wikipedia article. And that's why my presentation is so long, because those steps are so long. But before we really rush off, what I'd like you to do is, you see here a typical setting of knowledge transfer in a traditional background. So this is the Namibian village of Eribidukampe. Uh, you will see there one of the village elders and a few of the youngsters. And the, uh, I'd like you, I'd like you to, there's something very important missing in this picture, which I'll show you in the next slide. I'd like you to take five seconds to concentrate, to remember, and to try to find the difference to the picture that I'll be showing you next.
Ready? You think you can remember that picture if I show you the next slide? Yeah? Because remember we need an independent source by an expert in the subject and currently the English Wikipedia wouldn't say that the old man is an expert in his subject so what we need is a scientist, right? So that the picture really actually looks like this. Would you agree, would you agree that in the, in the rural setting of the Herero village of Erendirokambe that Dr. Rodeo from Denmark and his recording equipment are actually about as inconspicuous as, should we say, a tarantula on a cheesecake? Yeah. And would you, would you really trust that the village elder's tale is still the very same tale under these influences? That he's telling the same amount of detail as if that strange pretty much alien person right there. But all, all our published sources, academic sources, about indigenous knowledge have been created like this, more or less. Right? Everything. So there's a visitor entry. Now the visitor published his finding. Those findings are, are at first kind of dependent on how much did the visitor really understand? How fluent was that researcher in the language? Did he understand the context, the meaning, the non-verbal content? There's an enormous amount of non-verbal content. The medicine man would never take you to a medicinal plant if it wasn't ready for harvesting. And he will not tell you that Peter, it's March now, because otherwise I couldn't take you here. You can use this this uh, this plant only in March. It will be non-verbal. If it's not March, you will not take me there. Does the researcher have the knowledge to understand that? Obviously, the researcher might not be sufficiently literate. And if there's a translator, either the researcher brings the translator, Right? Then we have another alien influence, or the village brings the translator. That is then, of course, not a sworn translator, as you would know it, but just somebody who, hap who happens to speak both languages. Consciously or unconsciously, will the translator translate everything? Everything that's important. Everything that you need. That's quite difficult. Then, of course, the researcher will select facts that are relevant to his or her research. You will not select the facts relevant to the indigenous population. It's a very important point. The researcher comes up with the hypothesis and the researcher wants to prove the hypothesis. The researcher has, in all likelihood, no aim to preserve the indigenous knowledge as it is. But he needs to publish something that means his own interpretation needs to be there. Then there's peer review. I don't know how many researchers are in the room. I can tell you that during peer review of academic research, people will jump in and say, why don't you explain this development using a totally different theory? It makes a lot more sense. Right? And if you are desperate and if you need it published and if you're maybe not that established that you can kind of uh, put your own opinion on top of the peer reviewer, then you have to go with that. Facts and explanations change during peer review. Okay, and then we have more steps because now we have the publication. But now we have Wikipedia. And I don't know how about you, but I believe there's a good approach to summarize difficult stuff for Wikipedia. And that is this one, that you read the book, summarize its key findings, then you look, does Wikipedia know about that? And if not, you summarize it for Wikipedia. But what most of us are doing, seriously, what most of us are doing is put missing content, right? And then we do a keyword search. 
And then we do not read the entire book. We read the paragraph or a page or one and a half pages. We do not read the introduction. We do not read any caveats that, that the anthropologist has put in. We do not read explanations that are in full notes. We only read the rele relevant paragraphs. Then we paraphrase it. Then we put it into an article. <laughs> right? That's what we do. Okay. I'm also doing the second one much more often than the first one. I should have been that. And talking about paraphrasing, we don't need to we don't need to put some serious scientific research in there. There, there are all the researchers uh, that have published about that. Uh, Noam Chomsky being one of them, if you want to look it up. Uh, it is quite a question whether you can formulate the same thought, even the same thought, in a different language. And it's quite a question whether paraphrasing does lead to at least a slight twist of meaning. Right? That's very much questionable, whether you have a different set of words which exactly conveys the same meaning <coughs> and doesn't put any, any slight twist in. So that's another problem. To summarize, so that was a five-step solution, but actually how a narrative can get into Wikipedia, but actually it's not five steps. I'll show you, oh no, I'll not show you, I'll show you something else. There's step five, I forgot, step five, the editor community. So this is a typical setting where knowledge is being transferred in the village, right? Uh, so the young guy, the young lad learns, learns shooting and hunting, right? Um, well, even if we can put traditional uh, indigenous, I'm making a mistake myself, indigenous knowledge into a Wikipedia article, we still have the problem of notability, due weight, even if I find uh, a primary source, I still need to base my article on secondary sources, uh, encyclopedicity, and where does that come from? That comes from our Wikipedia community. And now I'd like you to, I, I hope you have located the knowledge bearer in this picture. He's sitting on the right. Yeah? Okay, let's check. Male, yes, tick. Educated, mm, 15 to 49 years old. White collar worker, developed country, liberal, technically current, English speaker. It's like the opposite side. He's ticking all the other boxes except male, right? So what's important to him and what's important to the other two, so the setting is basically the young one gets his first introduction and the other young man on the left-hand side is also still learning from the elder. The elder cannot do it anymore. He can just explain it. The young one has the power and can do it. And the child gets his first lesson, right? What's important in this setting, from the point of view of the old man, and remember, knowledge transfer works, has worked for 50,000 years at least. What's important to the old man is not necessarily what's important. Wikipedia community, simply due to the composition of the editor base. So, now I'm doing this. You see, I should have all learned my own slides. Um, okay, assume, assume we have a narrative somewhere in the village. Assume we want to take the content of that into a Wikipedia article. What needs to happen? I don't need to explain every step, I'll just show you. Number one, <coughs> there needs to be an alien influence. There is no academic in Erin de Forget it. There needs to be a translation. Those three people cannot speak English. Maybe the little kid can. The two older ones cannot, guaranteed. Then there's a selection. The researcher selects the important things and will publish only these. So, those first four things the upper axis, they determine the context, right? And the context needs to be captured, otherwise we will change that story. Now there comes the right axis, 
That is the publication process. First, the researcher is selecting something. Then the stuff is going through peer review. And then the stuff is being published or not being published. It's a possible outcome of a peer review that something is not being published. And now the bottom line, the bottom axis is the Wikipedia side of it, which adds another set of twists. Somebody Googles the keyword and somebody paraphrases the content. And I didn't even talk about article curation and things that have been reverted over the years without looking at the reference again. Um, and a good question is, is that still the same? It's not meant to be derogatory to the Chinese people present. I believe that thing is called Chinese whispers in English. Yeah, in German it's Stille Post. Whisper something into somebody's ear and somebody else whispers it to the neighbor, the neighbor whispers and the neighbor whispers, and after nine rounds, nine rounds, it's coming back. Is that still the same? Oh, okay, I wrote telephone in French, fantastic. So, another thing, I put this bending the rules in, not just to get more audience, but because I believe that's what we are doing. There's exactly one abstraction step in the entire process exactly one step of abstraction, and that is the selection of the researcher. There is no attempt to ever change the narrative of the village elder. The best thing you can achieve is that what you've printed in the book is exactly what the village elder said. Which means, no matter which publisher is printing this book, we have a primary source, not a secondary source. There is no secondary source for this kind of knowledge. So we are already bending the rules. We say, well, the book is a secondary source. The publisher is a secondary source. So the entire thing might be a secondary source. No. Things go from primary to secondary through abstraction, through generalization, through evaluation. Nothing of that is typically happening when indigenous knowledge is being published by Western visitors. And not surprisingly, maybe, those publications are riddled with errors. They're real little errors. I can tell you from Namibia, there's almost nothing right. Whenever they put an interpretation, it's wrong. Okay, but the word, would that be acceptable? I have a narrative, I have a peer review, and I have a selection, this time from the Wikipedia, from the Wikipedia, and then I put it into an article. Does that look better? It's shorter, certainly. But you might say, Peter, huh? you're cheating. Where is the peer review? Wait a moment. At first, indigenous knowledge is published knowledge. Obviously, in a writing system, our publication is writing. In an oral system, our publication is speaking. Why would, why would an oral knowledge system have a written publication? That's totally nonsense. A publication is dissemination of knowledge, and that happens orally in oral cultures. So it is published, orally published. Secondly, it is predictable. I'm trying to come back to that. It will occur again and again. If you have the 100th anniversary of a certain tribal leader, you will get his biography in the evening at the fire. Guaranteed. Trade of beer if you don't. Yeah? Pretty much like a museum director. If you go to a museum and you ask him about a particular item, it's very unlikely that you will get different stories every time. You will get the same story every time. And that is the story with those narratives about their knowledge. And it is peer reviewed. There is the peer. Another village elder. There's never only one. And if somebody talks nonsense on the fire about the history of the tribe, I've been there, I've seen that, then somebody else, they will let the old man speak because you don't interrupt other people. But somebody will raise their hand and say, well, in our family we tell this story in a different way and it will be immediately commented on and attacked. So it is peer reviewed. Just that the peer reviewers, of course, not another scientist, but another villager. And and I hope I make at least this one still. I think I have to cut a little bit short. Indigenous knowledge is verifiable knowledge. 
It is verifiable, it's just not easy, but I'll come to that argument. What would you have to do if you want to check out an indigenous knowledge piece? Yes, you would have to travel to that location. You have to learn the language, you have to understand the organization of the indigenous knowledge, which stories will likely come up at what time and what you have to do to trigger them. You have to gain the trust of the community, absolutely, otherwise they will not tell you. And then you have to request, in this case, a republication, an oral one. But wait a moment. Uh, oops, stop. This one you all know. Emphasis mine. The sum of all human knowledge. Indigenous or not. That's what we want. And I believe we haven't changed that yet to northern knowledge, western knowledge, scientifically proven things. We haven't done that. We've said the sum of all human knowledge. And now, please, kind of try to step in the shoes of the village elder who says, you wrote in nonsense about our tribe. And the Wikipedia says, but I've got a reference for that. And now the village elder wants to, wants to verify that fact. What would he have to do? Assume it's an offline citation to a library. And yes, he would have to travel to that location. He would have to learn the language. He would under have to understand how Western knowledge is organized. Remember your first time in a public library? Did you find the book immediately? Yeah? That can be difficult if the library is large. Did you know from the start that the librarian could help you who is sitting there in the corner? That is actually paid to help you there? Not really. And yes, you would have to gain the trust of the community if an Oberthemba elder steps into the reference library at Frankfurt. He's not going to get the book there. Believe me. Right? He's coming there in his shorts uh, with his with his leather hides and stuff. The librarian will not give him the book. Only after he knows that, that this is really a respectable person, then he will get the book. And it's not even 100% guaranteed that you will get the book because if it's ordered by somebody else, you know, then it's not available today. Sorry, you can't have it. So come next week. Yeah. So even that, of course it can happen to you. This story is not coming up. Sorry. Uh, yeah, come next week. Uh, that can happen to you in a library. So you see that the whole stuff is entirely, uh, entirely equal. So what we say when we say currently that indigenous knowledge is not very viable, we say it's not very comfortable, not very easy to verify it. It's not impossible to verify it, absolutely not. And this is my last slide, or the second last. The solution is allow oral citations. Uh, just like with template site, site book, site news, site journal, site oral. We would have to capture a few more things. It is absolutely, absolutely uh, inevitable that we need to capture the context, the occasion, the community. You can, you cannot have, you cannot have an Oshindonga speaker telling you a story about the Herero people. That's absolutely out of the question. Uh, that doesn't work. So it needs to fit. So there are reliable oral sources and unreliable oral resources, of course, right? You would have to capture the date and the place, and I haven't mentioned it explicitly. We do not attempt, we do not attempt to request a written republication Western style. We are running in all sorts of trouble, and by the way, I would never get it through my ethics board if we suggested that. So the point is not to record it and to put it to a comment in our perspective of our research board. The point is to say, no, no, it is verifiable as it is. Just go out there and listen to the village elder, learn the language, and you can verify it if you don't believe it. You could also just believe it. How often have I been looking up a library item in somebody else's Wikipedia article? I think I did that once, but uh, normally I would say, well, good faith, trust the people, it's really in that book. Uh, at the place where it's stated. So this is what we want. Um, and I think I've made a couple of, <coughs> yes, I think I've made a couple of good arguments. As I said, they are not all my good arguments. There are more people involved. Um, 
I would invite you to I'll skip the next slide. As I said, it's going to be in the afternoon, uh, activating Africa. I have another three minutes there. Um, OK, those slides are, of course, available of comment and comment. And uh, just a moment, I'm coming to you. And I don't know, those of you who've been publishing before know how difficult that is. We are going to publish a book in 2014. And I did convince, and for the occasion of Wikimedia 2013, I did convince the editor of the book to make a pre-release of the chapter on the CCBY, of the chapter that we are writing. It is on comments, everybody who is interested. I, there's many, many more good arguments that I couldn't make in 21 minutes. Uh, if you're interested, please read our paper. Uh, and believe me, it, was, it took me as long to convince the editor and as much ink virtual ink as it took me to write the entire paper uh, because that was really difficult but I thought it's maybe worth it maybe I can you know nudge the ball into the right direction give the thing a bit of trust you find both on comments under the category indigenous knowledge uh, maybe not surprisingly that category contains exactly the two items the slides and the paper there's nothing else in comments on indigenous knowledge. You also find it in the category oral citations, which I created in reminiscence of Achal Zabala's project. Um, and you'll find it on the category research or Wikimedia, but then there are hundreds of other items there. So if you go to one of the first two categories, you'll only find those two items. And uh, please enjoy reading it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, there's something that you touched on, um, uh, but I, I would love to hear a little bit more detail. What about types of knowledge which are only valuable because they're not transmitted to everyone in the whole world, the outside world? That they're they're sort of stories that you have to you have to, like you're saying, gain the trust and be integrated into the society and not give it away. Okay, the question is uh, whether knowledge that has been, or whether there might be knowledge that the indigenous community wants doesn't want to give away, right? Uh, and, and, and whether whether we might maybe there are some ethical implications as well, right? What we what we realize is uh, if we if we ask, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much foreigner there, and I'm as alien as as Dr. Odil from Denmark. Uh, what we what we realized is that now after a few years that we have the trust of the community that they are happy to share their knowledge because they do not see the consequences. They do not see what, for instance, happened with, with the, with the sand of, of, of Botswana and Namibia, that they lost the right to sell their own plants that they're using for 10,000 years as an appetite suppressant during the hunt. Uh, that's now a patent uh, owned by Unilever. And they might, of course, still use it by themselves, uh, but they might not make any profit from that through sale. So there is, there is tremendous ethical implications in that. And uh, that's why we have, when, 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 when we report on our research project, there's the full ethic committee panel sitting of 12 people, where otherwise they just do it via email and take it off. So that, that must be very much taken care of. And that is, that is a potential weakness. We, we need to always check the intellectual property of, uh, of those things. We would, on the other side, assume if there's really something that they want to make a secret that they wouldn't tell us. that when I've tried to put all the citations in Wikipedia. No, I haven't. Uh, at first, I'm abiding rules, and uh, there was a huge discussion on the reliable sources notice board in response to Mr. Bravala's uh, attempt, and it was uh, summarily dismissed uh, without, much, uh, without much further ado, and I haven't been doing that, but I am planning to do that, and I thought it to start, uh, I thought to start it off here at Wikimedia. To, to make it available to a larger audience, uh, and then maybe to start another discussion on the reliable sources that I support. Okay. 
So, so we are running over time. That means uh, from now on, you're sacrificing your lunch. Uh, you are welcome to ask further questions. Um, it sounds pretty difficult to, to complain to communities about these or any process to integrate all tradition in our rules, our lives. So instead of starting a fight or a big polemic or something. Would it be a better approach to start to make our own wiki with this purpose, this focus to try at, at any time to come near to Wikipedia, maybe merge, I don't know, with this specific topic, with this specific rules and try to develop that within our own wiki? Okay, the, 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 the suggestion from the gentleman was to to say, all right, instead of trying to convince and get editor consensus, particularly in English, I guess, we could as well kind of push that to smaller Wikipedias, make an own indigenous Wikipedia, and later merge the content. Um, what I hoped to be able to show is that the inclusion of indigenous knowledge will be of value for the English Wikipedia. And what I also tried to show is, at first, we are already bending the rules of reliable sources for this particular content. The content is there and we are bending the rules because it is a primary source. And what I want to show is, or what I wanted to show as well, I need three more words in one policy. I only need the definition of publishing. What does it mean for an oral culture? If I have that, I don't need to bend any other rules, not the reliable sources guideline, not the verifiability policy, not the what is Wikipedia, what Wikipedia is not pillar, and I don't need to go to ignore all rules. So that's basically the point. At first, I think it's valuable for the English Wikipedia, and secondly, I think we are not bending that many rules if we are doing that. It's just a misunderstanding, a Western-centered, uh, systemically biased view on what is publishing. Oh, one, two, three, no, that's not for me, what's uh, Thank you, this was fascinating and to me convincing. Uh, but I have a question about the end of the previous talk. Uh, do you have rough figures of uh, time and money investment in Africa in the three years? Yeah, it's to you, for your talk. You didn't get a yeah. that question. Uh, Who were 
Uh, it's just we need to see that either Wikipedia wants to be the sum of all human knowledge, or Wikipedia wants to be the sum of half of the human knowledge. The, the, the one from the Northern Hemisphere, that, that, that's a decision that we need to take. And if the answer is Wikipedia wants to be the sum of half of the human knowledge, the one that's, that's, that's available in writing, then we should maybe indeed form another Wikipedia where we say, okay, this is the other half. Uh, you see, that is always an easy way out to say, well, we populate the OGNR or Wikipedia or the, or the Koi Koi about Wikipedia with, with, with unreferenced content or with orally referenced content, and maybe sometime we will merge. Uh, at first, I don't believe that's ever going to happen if we can't convince the big Wikipedias, right? Secondly, uh, the others will look at us and say, see, they can't reference their content. That's why they're going to, to the incubator or to some, to some third, third league Wikipedia in terms of article count. I don't think that's the solution. I think you could enrich Wikipedia with that kind of knowledge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.